If you uh, grew up attending Sunday school or church services, you've probably gone through the book of Acts several times in your life, especially if you grew up in the Church of Christ. And I don't say that critically, but that just was something we studied and read and had in classes a whole lot. So a lot of you have, are very familiar with the book of Acts. But I also realize that we have people here who probably have never read through the book one time. So it's my hope and prayer that through this Sunday morning study that I, I began last week, that all of us will gain a fresh perspective on this, this wonderful portion of our scripture that we call the Acts of the Apostles. Last week I suggested to you that the church is led by, belongs to, and is empowered by the Holy Spirit. The church is not an organization that is dedicated simply to perpetuating the memory of Jesus. He is still at work among his people, and he is doing that work through the Holy Spirit. I'm hoping that this study will help all of us to understand that better and to, to uh, appropriate the power. I hope it will happen to us as a congregation and not only as individuals. And I hope that as we study Acts, that more and more we'll understand how the Spirit is leading us and empowering us today. Maybe even from today's lesson, there will be some insights into answering that question. But here's the passage, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. And you'll remember, I mentioned last week that I'm going to do all of my readings this, in this study from the New Living Translation. We're going to read through verse 26. It was not long after he said this that he was taken up into the sky while they were watching and he disappeared into a cloud. As they were straining their eyes to see him, two white-robed men suddenly stood there among them. And they said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring at the sky? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven and someday just as you saw him go, he will return. The apostles were on the Mount of Olives when this happened, so they walked the half mile back to Jerusalem, and then they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here's a list of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. They all met together continually for prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. During this time, on a day when about 120 believers were present, Peter stood up and addressed them as follows. Brothers, it was necessary for the scriptures to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided the temple police to arrest Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Judas was one of us chosen to share in this ministry with us. Judas bought a field with the money he received for his treachery, and falling there, he burst open, spilling out his intestines. The news of his death spread rapidly among all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name Akeldama, which means field of blood. Peter continued, it was, this was predicted in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. And again, let his position be given to someone else. So now we must choose someone else to take Judas's place. It must be someone who's been with us all the time that we were with the Lord Jesus, from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken up from us into heaven. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they all prayed for the right man to be chosen. Oh Lord, they said, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas the traitor in this ministry. For he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots. In this way, Matthias was chosen and became an apostle with the other eleven. As God prepared his disciples for Pentecost, which is coming, 
As he prepared his disciples for that, we see several things happening. I want to talk about those briefly today. First of all was the ascension of Jesus, verses 9 through 11. Now let me tell you, all through history, people have made fun of this event. And uh, I think I read just uh, this week about somebody uh, recently who said, well, he must have been the first astronaut you know, caught up in going up into the sky. And people have made fun of this event. And, and some people question the necessity of the ascension. And others say, oh, it's just a fairy tale. No, nobody can float up into the sky. That didn't happen. And if you really have thoughts like that, I'd like to ask you to consider your very concept of God. Because you may not have a problem with the ascension. You may have a God problem. If God can speak the universe into existence, if God can part the Red Sea, if God can clo close the mouths of lions, if he can raise the dead, then surely he would have no problem lifting Jesus up into heaven. I have no problem with it at all. But I think that the ascension is very important to the whole story of Jesus. We don't talk much about it today in the church. We talk about the crucifixion and we talk about resurrection, but we don't say much about the ascension. It's kind of like, well, I guess that happened, but it doesn't have a lot of importance. I think it does. Jesus could have vanished secretly, invisibly, but he ascended in a public, visible way because he wanted his disciples to know that he was gone for good until the second coming. Now, during this interim time between the resurrection and ascension, if you remember the story, he, he, he kept appearing and disappearing and reappearing. But now that interim period is over, and it's time. this time his departure is final. So they weren't to wait around for his next appearing. It wasn't like, now, I wonder if next Sunday he's going to show up again, like he did last week. They're not to do that. Now they are to wait for the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit comes upon them, they're to get on with the mission of being witnesses to the world. And I think it's so important that he ascends visibly so they can know he's gone now for good. And there's something else that has to be done. And I think for us, this event has significance because it reminds us that Jesus has gone to be at the right hand of God, to, to be there with all the authority that God has invested in him. Now, only Luke among the gospel writers tells us about the ascension. He does in the gospel and he does here in Acts. Now, Somebody will say, yeah, Mark does. Yeah, in that long ending of Mark, and if you remember a few months ago, I said we really... That really doesn't belong there. So to me, only Luke mentions the ascension. But several other New Testament writers writing in the letters do refer to it. I call your attention to what Peter said. Peter, an eyewitness of this event, said, Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor or at the right hand of God. And all the angels and authorities and powers are bowing before him. 1 Peter 3 and verse 22. It's important for us to remember that Jesus has gone and now is reigning with all authority and power over this world and over the whole universe. The ascension also, though, reminds us that Jesus is going to come back. Those two angels said to the disciples, someday, just as you saw him go, he will return. The return of Jesus is one of the cardinal tenets of our faith, and it's echoed throughout the New Testament. In fact, our New Testament ends with this prayer, amen. Come, Lord Jesus, Revelation twenty two twenty. The ascension is important. It does, it does add a great deal to our faith and our understanding of what God's doing. Now, the second happening before Pentecost was what I want to call waiting and prayer, verses 12, 13, and 14. Now, before he ascended, Jesus had told them, back in last week's text, he had told them to wait until the promised Holy Spirit had come upon them. And so now we see them obeying him, and they are waiting, and they are praying while they're waiting. This is the first time in the book of Acts that prayer is mentioned, but it plays such 
a significant role in the life of the church. It was just a, a constant part of, of their lives. Let me, let me give you a sampling. As we read just a moment ago, the disciples prayed for guidance in selecting a successor for Judas, chapter 1. They prayed for courage to witness for Christ, chapter 4. Stephen prayed as he was being stoned to death, chapter 7. Peter and John prayed for the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Spirit, chapter 8. Peter prayed before he raised Dorcas from the dead, chapter 9. Cornelius, the Roman centurion, prayed that God would show him what he wanted him to do, chapter 10. Peter was on a rooftop or a housetop praying when God told him to go to Cornelius, also in chapter 10. The church gathered together to pray for Peter while he's in prison, chapter 12. The church in Antioch prayed and fasted before sending out Barnabas and Saul on the first missionary journey, chapter 13. It was at a prayer meeting that God opened Lydia's heart to the gospel, chapter 16. It was prayer that opened the prison doors for Paul and Silas in Philippi, chapter 16. Paul prayed for his friends on a couple of occasions before leaving them in chapter 20 and in chapter 21. In the midst of a storm at sea, Paul prayed for God's deliverance, chapter 27. On the island of Malta, Paul prayed for a sick man who was healed, chapter 28. You can't get away from the fact that the early church prayed all the time. Prayer is a, 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 a vital part of the life of the church in that day and in our day. And in our text, we see an example of, of what I want to call prevailing prayer because what Luke tells us is they all met together continually for prayer. And, and folks, it is this kind of prayer, prevailing prayer, that has accompanied every spiritual waking, awakening, every revival that has ever happened. Matthew Henry, and you know that name, the, the, his famous commentaries on the New Testament. But Matthew Henry said that, that when God wants to do something special in the world, he first gets his people to start praying. And example after example after example could be given, and I want to give you one. In the 1850s, prior to the Civil War, here in the United States, our country was in a very weakened moral, spiritual condition. You may not think that, oh, the 1850s, you know, I'm sure ever, no. It was a very, very weak time for us spiritually. And in 1857, a quiet 46-year-old businessman by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere felt led to begin a noontime prayer meeting in New York City he wanted to do this for business people who could meet for prayer. Anyone could attend. You could come for a few moments. You could spend the whole hour. On the first day, Lamphier prayed alone for the first 30 minutes. But by the end of the hour, six other men from at least four different denominational backgrounds had joined him. Twenty came the next week and 40 the week after that. And soon they decided they'd meet every day, and the group swelled to over 100. Pastors who, who came uh, started morning prayer meetings in their own churches, and before too long, similar meetings were being held all over the nation. Within six months, there were more than 10,000 people meeting every day in New York City alone. And that's the beginning of what we now call the Great Awakening in North America. It is estimated that after that, in a two-year period, Two million people were led to Christ. And I want you to remember, we had a population then of 30 million. Two million people in that great awakening. But it began with one man wanting to pray for revival in our country. Folks, prayer is never the wrong thing to do. It is never the wrong thing to do. It's the thermostat for the church. Spiritual temperature goes up or down depending on how God's people pray. And it's not just individual private prayer that's important. That is, 
But did you notice the first century Christians came together to pray? And that's something that I think we need to do more often as a church. We need to pray together. I, I, I don't discourage you praying individually and privately, but there's something about the body of Christ coming together for prayer that's powerful and important. Now, the third event before Pentecost then was the selection of a person to replace Judas. This is 50, verses 15 through 26 in our text. Now, a lot of things could be said in this, about this story, and I'm only going to focus on a few and maybe not the things you'd like to hear. Like, I'm really not going to talk about how he hanged himself or, did, or his, you know, he fell headlong and his intestines all came out. And I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I, I just can't focus on everything. But here's what I want to talk about today. First of all, there were about 120 believers at that time, we're told in verse 15. You know, that's just about how many were in this assembly last week. 120 people. And that number reminds me of what God is able to do with a small group. 120 people literally then went out not long after that and changed the world. And so... Again, you know, as I talked a few weeks ago about the power and the influence and the significance of small churches, here's a very small group, 120 of them, but God did powerful things through that number. Secondly, I, Judas' act of, of betrayal that we read about in the Gospels, it's something Peter says that was predicted in Scripture. In fact, he quotes from Psalm 69 and Psalm 109, and, and, and this theme of God's sovereign will at work even in e evil times and evil things is one that occurs several times in the apostles' teaching, not just in Acts but throughout the New Testament. But later in Acts, listen to this, Peter will declare that the crucifixion of Jesus, which at one level is one of the most evil, cruel things that ever happened, but that the crucifixion was according to God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. That's going to be Acts 2.23. And that perspective is important for me because it helps me to, to, to believe, it helps me to know that God can turn the evil done to us into good. He takes Judas's evil act, he has even predicted it, and he turns it into something in a way that's good, something that brings about his salvation to the world. Now, I want to be careful here. Because I'm not suggesting that Judas is to be excused for what he did. Notice the language that Peter uses when he talks about Judas. He guided the temple police to arrest Jesus. He bought a field with the money he received from his, did you get the word, treachery? Judas, Peter says later on, the traitor has deserted us. So I don't think we can excuse Judas. He's not an innocent man. Now, he's not just a puppet in God's hands and God's making him do all this. That's not it at all. Judas made deliberate, evil choices. God used them, but, but he made these choices on his own. And, and he is held accountable for that. God will deal with him in his own way. But what really impressed me is that how the other disciples were hurt by this treachery. They're deeply hurt. In fact, in verse 19, something you might just pass over like that, Peter says that the news of his death, the news of Judas' death, spread rapidly among all the people of Jerusalem. Just like wildfire, the news of what Judas has done goes all over. You know what I think Peter's saying? I think he may be expressing the shame and the humiliation that Judas brought on the name of Jesus and all of his followers. Everybody in town knows what Judas has done. And can you imagine what they might have been saying to the apostles at that time? Well, yeah, you, you claim that this Jesus is the Messiah? You, you say he's the Son of God? He's the one who's come to save us from our sins? How did he not know any better then to choose a man like Judas to be one of his closest friends? I mean, even the treasurer of your little group. Don't give me that. This man can't be the Messiah. This man can't be the Savior. He didn't even know about Judas. Can you imagine stuff like that being said? All over town, everybody very quickly knew. And I think he's saying, to our shame, to our humiliation, to the degradation of the name of Christ, Christ. 
He did this. And I think we can all relate to that. Because we, we know what it's like to be betrayed, don't you? You know what it's like to be humiliated and shamed by a friend or by a relative. Entire churches experience that. When one of their members, and especially a leader, defects and goes off into a sinful life. We've seen that happening just recently here in our area. And we, we, we see whole churches being affected by that. And if we're not careful, when it happens either as a church or as individuals, families, if we're not careful, bitterness and anger and even hatred can develop in our lives. And let me tell you, bitterness can greatly hinder your spiritual life. Bitterness will battle with the love of God which the Holy Spirit pours into our hearts. And that battle between bitterness and love can leave you spiritually exhausted and even dampen or quench the work of the Holy Spirit. And maybe this story of Judas' defection and how it affected, I think, the whole church at that time will help us to handle the pain of disappointment when it comes to us. Remember, first of all, that Jesus had to face that himself. The Lord himself had to deal with the disappointment of a close friend betraying him. Paul had to deal with the hurt of defection and apostasy and unfaithfulness among his friends and co-workers. Remember, Demas, in love with this present world, has forsaken me. I find a certain kind of comfort in knowing I'm not alone when I'm hurt by somebody else. There's a certain kind of comfort that comes from knowing Jesus went through that. The apostles on, you know, before Pentecost went through that. Paul went through it. But I'm also encouraged when I think of this whole thing, I'm encouraged by the desire of Peter and the others to get on with the work that was set before them. Listen again to his words in verses 21 and 22. So now we must... Not like, that might be nice if we, we have to choose someone else to take Judah's place. It must be someone who's been with us from the time, uh, all the time that we were with the Lord, from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken up from us into heaven. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. You know what I hear him saying? Yeah, we've really been hurt. Judas really hurt the whole cause of Christ. But we have a job to do. Let's get on with it. Let's get on with what God has called us to do. And aren't we called to do the same thing? When we're hurt and disappointed and discouraged by someone's failure, someone's rejection, someone's betrayal, we get up, we dust ourselves off, we seek God's will and God's power, and we get on with the task before us. Now, a lot of people don't want to hear that. We would rather nurse our wounds and feed our grudges. That gives us an excuse for our anger. The message that I get from the text in this regard is this. Let the experience of Jesus and Paul and all of those early Christians comfort you. And let us acknowledge God's sovereignty in all of this, as Peter did. And then let's look beyond the hurt and beyond the disappointment. Let's look to the task that is set before us of being witnesses in the world of Jesus. Let go of your grudges, folks. Let go of the hurt and the pain, and let's get on. I, 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 I need that message. Let's get on with the task. I leave you with this final word from Paul. Remember, he had been betrayed. He had been disappointed. He had been hurt. He had been abandoned by friends and coworkers. And here's what he says to the little church in the city of Ephesus. And this is his word to me. This is the word I need to hear, and I think the word you need to hear today. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, and all types of malicious behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. Tender-hearted, 
forgiving one another just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. I see that happening with those early disciples. It happens with us. And I just leave you with that word.